Move to question time. Oh. Uh, sir. By, I seek leave to make a statement concerning minister arrangements. Senator well, I am seeking Sorry. leave. <laughs> Sorry, Senator Wong. Um, I advise changes to ministerial arrangements, which uh, Senator Farrell. Sorry, Senator. It's all right. Uh, just for the Chamber's awareness, Senator Farrell will be absent from question time today on account of ministerial business overseas. In his absence, ministers will represent portfolios at question time in accordance to the letter that I have circulated to pres the President and party leaders and independent senators. Uh, we now move to question time and I call Senator Dean Smith. Very much, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Yesterday the Treasurer said in Parliament, Bill Evans from Westpac, a very respected economist, said, I don't expect them to put upward pressure on interest rates. Today, Mr Evans said, the risk is that the stimulus that's in the economy in 2023-2024 proves to be stronger than the Reserve Bank is comfortable with and therefore they don't have the scope to cut rates as early as February. He said the timing of the first Reserve Bank cut will be the factor where the budget may have an implication. Does the Treasurer still agree with Bill Evans, whose comments clearly show that Labor's budget risks interest rates being higher for longer? Thank you, Senator Smith. Uh, Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you very much, and I thank uh, Senator Smith for the question. Uh, we are very confident that the budget uh, providing cost of living relief and important investments into services like uh, medic. Well, give me a second. Uh, in fact, you've given me 12, so I appreciate that before the interjection starts, Senator Cash. <laughs> Uh, but uh, without adding to inflation, and I would know there is a lot, there is a fair bit of commentary around um, about the budget, as you would expect, as you would expect uh, two days later. But Treasury's assessment, which provides advice to the government, which uh, supported us in finalising our budget decisions, Treasury's very clear assessment is that this budget will not add to inflationary pressures, and that is clear right through the budget papers. <coughs> the cost of living package is expected to directly reduce inflation by three quarters of a percentage point in 2023-24. And I would remind those opposite that, uh, uh, that a reasonable proportion of the spending that's happening uh, in this financial year is to do with the legacy pressures that we inherited from you. So it's spending that was continuing up and then it was stopping, and we are keeping uh, that, uh, those services and those agencies going. But I would note it would be very unusual, I think, to get uh, all the economists in Australia, particularly those that provide commentary, and for them to agree uh, on one point, I would say. It's not unusual, thoroughly unsurprising that you would have a range of views. I note um, that there has been uh, comments from uh, Mr Evans from Westpac. Um, in fact, I had some discussions with Westpac yesterday and I have a direct quote from Mr Evans where he says that he believes the policies were necessary, that's the investments we were making, and I don't expect them to put upward pressure on interest rates in the near term. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Senator Smith, Senator Dean Smith, first supplementary. President, a supplementary question. <clears throat> yesterday you told the Chamber the budget was fiscally neutral, but today your colleague, the Minister for Aged Care, said that, and I quote, this is a budget that will put downward pressure on inflation, in contrast to economists from countless banks and rating agencies who have called this budget expansionary. Are you seriously arguing that the Minister for Aged Care is correct and that the majority of Australia's leading economists uh, are wrong? Thank you, Senator Smith. The time has expired. Minister Gallagher. Thank you, President. It would appear that Senator Smith wasn't listening to every single word I said in question time yesterday. I'm horrified. I'm horrified out of everyone. Senator Smith, I expect you. You're a man, you're a man with the eye on the detail. I know that from appearing before you in estimates. Uh, but I think if you go back and have a look at what I was saying, I was saying 
uh, that uh, the Treasury advice is that the cost of living package is expected to directly reduce inflation by three quarters of a percentage point in 2023-24. I said it, in fact, in answer to your first question as well. So uh, I think the uh, answers given by uh, uh, Minister Wells are completely consistent with the answers that I gave yesterday. I said that it puts downward pressure in 23-24 and across the forwards is, is broadly neutral. That, that is the point that we have been making for the past uh, two days. And I would say— Thank you, Minister. The time oh, for answering I'm has sure expired. I'll get an Senator Dean Smith, second supplementary. Thank you, Thank you President. Can the minister assure the Senate that not one of the measures in Labor's budget were thought to be inflationary in the independent Treasury advice you referred to in your first answer? Thank you, Senator Smith. Minister Gallagher. Budget is a range of decisions, hundreds if not thousands of decisions that work together. Uh, and the focus, of, the focus of the ERC has been very clearly to make investments where we can, to make sensible cost of living relief package where we can find room to do so, and to not have those measures add to inflation. We have been consistent across that from the beginning of putting this budget together uh, to the release of this budget. It has been front and centre of our thinking. But we have had to accept that there is a need to provide some sensible, modest uh, investments where we can afford to do so. You see those in the cost of living package, where we can find room to support other investments like Medicare to make sure that bulk billing uh, continues on. Then we've made that as well. The Treasury advice was very clear, cannot be clearer. Look forward to exploring this in estimates that the decisions taken in this budget and they reflect, uh, are not inflationary and they are reflected Minister, the in the inflation for forecast in the budget. Senator White. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Women, Senator Gallagher. Can the Minister outline how the budget delivers for women in Australia? Thank you, Senator White. Minister. Uh, thank you, um, Pre President. I thank Senator White for the question and for her um, career-long uh, effort in supporting uh, the rights of working women uh, right around this country. Equality for women is at the heart of what we do as a Labor government, and there is no other government in recent memory that has done as much for Australian women as we have tried to do in our first year in government. For too long, Australians were treated as second-class citizens, and after nine years of blokey budgets, this is finally a budget that delivers for women. It delivers for all women now and into the future, but gives the most economically vulnerable immediate Order. relief. Our investments in parenting payments single, our increase in Commonwealth uh, rent Gallagher, assistance— Minister please resume your seat. Uh, I have called order Senator Henderson and Senator Hume. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you. Our increase to working age payments, and I'm pleased that we are abolishing the punitive Parents Next program from the 1st of July 2024, and designing a new voluntary. I'm sorry, but Senator, Senator Henderson, Henderson keeps interjecting, and, and I can't Hume. quite. I can't hear myself think, President. Oh. Uh, Minister, resume your seat. Order, particularly on my left, Senator Hume. I've just called you twice now, three times. To not to stop the interjections, Minister Gallagher. Thank you. We are supporting women's economic equality and helping to close the gender pay gap with investments to support highly feminised workforces, including fu fully funding a wage increase for aged care workers, investing in the Australian Skills Guarantee, which includes national targets for women in apprenticeships, and investing in building and retaining the early childhood education workforce. Over half of, uh, an additional half a billion in further investment in the national plan to end violence against women and children, to bring total funding for investment in that national plan to a record of $2.3 billion. And there's a number of measures which address women's health priorities, including $26.4 million to support health and medical research focusing on women's health. Thank you, Minister. Senator White, first supplementary. Thank you, Minister, for that comprehensive answer. It's a shame it was hard to hear, but I understand um, those who are used to developing blokey budgets won't listen. 
Can the minister outline how the budget builds on the significant investments in women Order. already made by the Albanese government in just a year of government? Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, um, Senator White, and I hope you can hear the answer to this. Uh, the answer to your question. In our first budget, less than six months after the election, we initiated the structural changes that will continue on, hopefully for generations, to improve the lives of all Australian women. This, our approach is not a sugar hit for women. It's going to change the landscape for women in this country. It builds on the investments we made in October, which will shift the dial on gender equality. This means investing in women's experiences across the board. For example, our investments in cheaper childcare and paid parental leave. We've invested in making the workplace relations system work better for women, including by putting gender equality at the, f at the heart of the Fair Work Commission's decision making and by implementing the Respect at Work recommendations so that women are safer at work. We're investing in women's safety, including to introduce paid domestic and family violence leave and in consent and respectful relationships education. Thank you, Minister. Senator White, second supplementary. Uh, can the minister outline how this budget demonstrates the government's commitment to ensuring that the experiences of women are at the heart of the budget process? Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, President, and thank you, Senator for White, for the question. And just before I start that answer, could I welcome the Buralula women who are in the back row up in the uh, chamber there? Um, coming from uh, Senator McCarthy. Uh, a big hello from us and so great to have you in the Senate here, particularly when we're talking about our investments uh, in women across the country. Our achievements, investments and actions have been uh, made deliberately and specifically to benefit women and contribute to gender equality, not because women are an afterthought or uh, something, an add-on, something that you do at the end of the budget process. These are efforts that have been led by the Prime Minister down and across the Cabinet and reflect not only the values of the government, which is a majority female government, but the Australian people. And these priorities will be carried forward in the budget process through our gender responsive budgeting, our women's budget statement and the measures which support those. Thank you, Minister. Um, Senator McKenzie. Thank you, Madam President. My question is to Minister Watt representing the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport, Regional Development and Local Government. The government has had almost a year to assess and evaluate the $120 billion infrastructure pipeline and make funding decisions. Last week, the government announced a 90-day infrastructure review, placing hundreds of projects and billions of dollars of investment under a cloud. A genuine review would have assessed the merits of all projects in the pipeline. Why are the $9.7 billion of Labor election commitments exempt from the infrastructure review, particularly given many are smaller projects of a type often criticised by Minister King and, in the case of the Melbourne Suburban Rail Loop, also have a scathing order to General's report? Thank you, Senator McKenzie. Minister Watt. Thank you, uh, President, and thank you, Senator McKenzie. It's nice to get a question from the National Party. We're still waiting for one about agriculture, uh, but one day they'll get there. Um, and it is important that we ensure that the Commonwealth Government's infrastructure program uh, can actually be delivered, can actually be funded, that there are the skills available to build these projects. That, of course, was something that the former government never had any concern about because the coalition, all the coalition ever used to do was get out the colour-coded spreadsheets work out which seats they needed to put, in, put some projects into, and off to the races. Off we go. We'll go out there and make some commitments. We won't worry about whether we can pay for them. We won't worry about whether there's the tradies to build them. All we'll do is go out and make an announcement. We'll trick people into thinking they're going to get a big road, and we'll never actually get around to delivering it. So this is exact. And you know, I, I note Senator McKenzie has something to say about Auditor General reports. I would have thought she might be wanting to stay away from that. Uh, but you know, we're all happy to talk about Auditor General reports that happened about the former government, uh, including Senator McKenzie, whether it be sports uh, programs, infrastructure Senator programs. Senator please resume your seat. Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you. On relevancy, the minister has gone nowhere near why the election commitments given by the Labor Party, $9.7 billion of projects, aren't also subject to the review. Thank you, Senator McKenzie. I will draw the minister to the question. Thank you. Minister. Uh, thank you, President. Well, again, unlike the coalition government, this government actually believes that it's important to deliver on your election commitments, just as we think it's important to deliver on construction infrastructure projects that are already underway. Uh, so we have said 
uh, that election order. commitment projects order. or projects that are already under construction, including projects like the Rockhampton Ring Road, something that I know Senator Chisholm, Senator Green and myself have been very strong supporters of. Those projects will go ahead uh, while we review the bucket loads of projects in the former government's uh, infrastructure Watt, program that were— Please in resume your seat. Uh, Senator Henderson, I did call you to order and you continued with your interjections. I would ask you to listen in silence. Minister, please continue. Thank you, President. So, yeah, we make no apologies for delivering on our commitments and we make no apologies for following through and delivering projects that are already under construction. But the reality is the infrastructure program that we inherited from the former government had blown out from around 150 projects, nationally significant projects, to over 800 projects which could not be delivered, that were never funded, that never had a plan to be delivered because they were all about making an announcement. Thank you, Minister Watt. Uh, Senator McKenzie, first supplementary. There seems to be some confusion about which projects are exempt from the review and which aren't. Melbourne is one of only 18 airports from the 100 busiest in the world without a rail link. Who requested the $10 billion Melbourne Airport Rail Link project be subject to the infrastructure review? Was it the Minister, the Prime Minister or the Victorian State Labor President? Premier. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator McKenzie. Minister. Well, we know that we know that Senator McKenzie and a number of her colleagues have a bit of an obsession with the Victorian Premier, Premier uh, and that for years now they have traduced his reputation in this chamber uh, uh, with the hope of winning seats in Victoria, but all they ever actually do is go backwards. Uh, and I think we're, in, we're, all, we're all interested in the goings-on in the Victorian Liberal Party because uh, that weeping sore of a branch— uh, Senator Watt, please resume your seat. Um, Senator McKenzie. On relevancy to the question, Madam President, it was a very simple question about the airport rail link in yep. Melbourne and who decided it would be subjected to Thank the review. You, it wasn't, Senator McKenzie. I didn't want to, you know, treat uh, on the Premier. Senator McKenzie, I remind all senators there's no need to repeat the question. I will draw uh, Minister Watt to the question. Thank you. Minister Watt. Um, well, I mean, I know this might be hard for Senator McKenzie and the National Party to understand, but the Labor Party doesn't operate in a way where our party presidents dictate what happens in infrastructure programs. I mean, I know that's what happens in the National Party and the Liberal Party, that you get the faceless men out there you know, coming in and telling uh, you what Minister to do Watt, and fund this Minister project Watt, and fund that project. Please, Jim, you'll see order across the chamber. Senator Ayres, I've just called the Senate to order. Minister Watt, please continue. Thank you. So, as I say, we don't operate on the basis of uh, the coalition where we have outside political uh, intermediaries dictating uh, what we should Minister do. Like, I know you don't want to hear it. Resume but resume your seat. Senator Birmingham. Point, point of order, President. On the matter of direct relevance, the question was very clear. It went to whether it was the Prime Minister, the Premier or the Minister who interfered. Now, the Minister's had his fun for 46 seconds now, but in the remaining 14 seconds, I urge you to draw him to the question and encourage him to be directly relevant to it and give a clear answer. Uh, thank you, Senator Birmingham. I will again refer the minister to the question. Um, well, uh, what I'm trying to do in rejecting the premise of the question is point out that we operate differently, uh, that we operate on the basis of delivering projects that have been funded, that have business cases, that can be delivered rather than making announcements. Uh, Senator McKenzie, second supplementary. The Herald Sun today reports that the Minister's staff claimed she misspoke at her May 1 press conference when she gave an emphatic, and I quote, no, it doesn't include to the airport rail link. When saying the $10 billion Melbourne airport rail link would not be part of the review, did Minister King misspeak? And when else has she misspoken about other projects ruled in and out of the review? Will the government release a full list of projects subject to the review, given the lack of clarity on what is exempt thank and what is Senator McKenzie. The time for asking has expired, Minister. Um, thank you, President. Thank you, Senator McKenzie. Well, I have no reason to disagree with the comments that are in the Herald Sun today uh, about that issue. Um, but let's not forget the reason why we need this review in the first place, and that is because we inherited an infrastructure program that had blown out from 150 projects of national significance Senator to over Starr. 800, littered with projects that were all about pork barrelling, 
didn't matter whether they could be delivered, grossly underfunded, grossly underfunded, unable to be delivered. I mean, there's the inland rail, the inland rail, that, that signature piece of Order. the National Party at Order. work. Senator I mentioned Birmingham. yesterday that the National Party was full of e economic illiterates, and if there is one example better than any other, it is the inland rail, where the project has blown out in cost from, is it 15 billion to 31 billion, or is it 32 or 33 or 34? Doubled in cost. We're not talking about small beer here. We are talking billions of dollars. There's the urban congestion fund, the commuter car parks. We are cleaning up the mess, and we're Thank going to have Minister, an infrastructure the program time for we deliver. Answering has expired. Senator Barbara Pocock. Sorry, wrong page. <laughs> Didn't know I was next. Um, on the 6th, my question is to the Minister of Finance. Sorry for the delay. On the 16th of November, the Tax Practitioners Board ruled that the former PwC partner, Peter Collins, leaked confidential government tax plans and sold advice to clients to help them sidestep multinational tax avoidance laws. Since then, PW has been awarded more than 77 million in new government contracts. All you and the government have done to date is speak of reputational damage as the penalty for PwC and to seek assurances from PwC that they won't do it again. Will the government immediately cease and ban all contracts with PwC? Thank you, Senator Pocock. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, uh, President. <laughs> I thank Senator Pocock for the question. And on the issue, I think we have all been deeply shocked. Uh, by the information that has been uncovered through that inquiry. Uh, and I think, uh, certainly from my point of view, uh, deeply disappointed that um, you know, processes that are put in place so that we in can engage in, um, uh, in uh, reasonable open discussion uh, confidentially about how certain legislation is drafted and its potential impact. Uh, where we work with stakeholders, um, not just through, obviously through um, places like PwC, but more broadly, uh, has been compromised in this way. Uh, I've read all the emails that have been uh, provided through Senator O'Neill's um, at Senator O'Neill's request that have gone through uh, to the committee, and I think they uh, they reflect very poorly on PwC. Indeed, um, I know that the uh, treasurer has asked uh, his secretary to provide advice to the government on what further steps are needed to respond to these matters uh, beyond the recommendations of the Tax Practitioners Board. And I have also asked my department some time ago to look at what can be done in the procurement framework and in contract management processes to ensure the integrity of suppliers, but also uh, to act as a, a very significant deterrent to this kind of behaviour occurring uh, again. I, am yet, I haven't received that advice yet. Uh, we've been finalising the budget, by, but I expect that I will, will get it uh, reasonably soon, and I'm happy to update you as I get it. I'm, my understanding is I am not well, the government um, doesn't directly engage through the departments, through their contractual arrangements, uh, that, um, that stopping those contractual arrangements you, where they exist the is not an option available to them. Senator Pocock, first supplementary. Taxpayers are looking more for more than discussion and advice. The ATO estimated that up to $180 million in tax revenue could have been at risk from the PwC breach. Why is this matter not being invested, investigated by the Australian Federal Police under the Crimes Act, and will the government sue PwC to recover any lost revenue? Thank you, Senator Pocock. Um, Minister Gallagher. Thank you. Um, well, I think uh, in, in response to the um, assertion that the Australian people deserve more than discussion and advice, uh, it is uh, not unusual uh, before a government takes whatever future steps, if they are available to us, um, whether that's through the Treasury or the Finance, to take advice on that before making a decision. Uh, so I don't think that's unusual. I think what I am saying to you is that the government is extremely um, concerned about what has been uncovered uh, through the Tax Practitioners Board's inquiry. Uh, we, have, we are aware of the material, we have looked at it, and we are taking further advice on what further can be done 
uh, to deal with it. Um, I think that's what people would expect from a responsible government. That's the steps the Treasurer and I have put in place. That is what we will follow, and when we get that advice back, we will make further decisions. Thank you, Minister. Senator Pocock, second supplementary. Thank you for that answer. PwC monetised confidential government information to earn $2.5 million in fees from 14 clients to sidestep new multinational tax avoidance laws. In this clear case of systemic corruption and cover-up, which everyone in this place must find abhorrent, will you work with this parliament and support the Greens' referral of this matter to the National Anti-Corruption Commission? Thank you, Senator Pocock. Minister uh, Thank you. Well, um, as, as senators know, anyone can make a referral to the uh, National Anti-Corruption Commission. They can uh, then the commission determines. Uh, makes its own decisions about what matters it will investigate. I can say that the government is appalled uh, by the behaviour of PwC in this uh, situation. It has compromised our ability to work with third parties around uh, developing up policy and legislation. And the Treasurer and I have taken the matter very seriously, and we are currently looking at what further steps are available in my area around the procurement framework, around panels, around future work, around all of those things, uh, to make sure that not only are we putting in place tighter processes uh, for those that are awarded contracts, but that we have a very significant deterrent about this kind of behaviour occurring again. Thank you, Minister. Senator Green. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Regional Development, Senator Watt. Colleen is a registered nurse living in Theodore, west of Gladstone. Colleen has found it impossible to secure housing. On the housing crisis, Colleen has said, and I quote, we don't have any options. We are out on the street. Basically, we are homeless. What is the Albanese government doing to address housing challenges in regional and rural Australia? Uh, Minister Watt. Thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Green, for being such a strong advocate for the needs of regional Queenslanders. It, it's a shame we don't have a few more of them in this place, especially, over, especially sort of around there, or sort of around there in particular. Uh, and certainly, Colleen's story in central Queensland is not an isolated one. At the end of last year, the vacancy rate in our home state of Queensland was 0.8%. And the numbers in the regions were far worse, particularly in Gladstone, the Southern Downs, the Cape, Gundawindi and the Tablelands, all seeing near zero vacancy rates. The lack of housing in regional Australia disproportionately hurts women, low and middle income earners, the very essential workers and tradies that certain people that say they stand up for. It constrains regional economies and puts people in really difficult living situations. And it is the direct result of nine years of inaction and underfunding of housing from the former coalition government, who pretend they, that they are on regional Australia's side but always let them down. For years under the former government, we saw state governments, peak groups and regional communities crying out for national leadership and funding from their federal government to address what was a looming housing crisis. And as a result of their inaction, as a result of the mess they left behind, we see far too many regional Australians being hit by growing rents, struggling to buy a home and facing or experiencing homelessness. Now we, of course, as the new Labor government, have a policy to deliver 30,000 new social and affordable rental homes across five years through the Housing Australia Future Fund. Uh, and in fact, we've committed to distribute the homes equitably across urban, regional and remote Australia. So why are Senators Canavan and Macdonald, for instance, working with the Greens to stop this from happening? Why Order. is Gladstone-based Senator Ormond Payne uh, taking instructions from the inner-city-based Brisbane housing spokesperson on the other side of the building? These people should get behind Thank regional you, Australia Minister, and back in those homes. Thank you, Minister. time for answering has expired, Senator Green. As Senator Canavan, I've called order. Senator Canavan. Uh, Senator Green, first supplementary. Thank you, President. Kelly, a disability pensioner from, pensioner from Tasmania, <laughs> was forced to live in a tent while waiting over eight months for social housing, and she was on the priority list. Can the minister outline how the Albanese government's housing initiatives guarantee social and affordable ha housing for regional and Order. rural Australia? Are you uh, just a moment, Minister. I'm waiting for silence before I call the minister. Minister what? 
Thank you, President. Thank you, Senator Green, for the question. And certainly, we all know the impacts the housing crisis is having in Tasmania, none more so than our Tasmanian senators. Uh, and I thank the advocacy of local senators from this side of the House, as well as Senators Lambie and Tyrrell, uh, for their willingness to work together for good housing outcomes. It's a little bit of a shame that a couple of other senators from Tasmania didn't have the same approach. Order. The Albanese government has been working hard to implement housing initiatives to increase housing supply in regional and rural ta Australia. For in Tasmania, for example, we're delivering 48 new affordable homes in Launceston uh, in partnership White, with community Mr. housing. Mr. Senator McKim. Senator McKim. Order. Minister, please continue. Thank you, President. We're also delivering 181 new homes in northwest Tasmania, funded by the National Housing Finance and Investment Corporation, in partnership with Housing Choices Tasmania. These are the th sort of things that we're doing in regional Queensland right now, and if we can get the Senate to agree, we want to Order. do more. And that's why we've included in Housing Australia's uh, investment Watt. mandate— Minister Minister Watt, please hear me. Order. Oh, Senator Rennick. And Senator Canavan, I've called you about three times. I expect order when I call it. Minister Watt, please continue. Thank you, President. I mean, I know they're working together on the votes, but it seems that they're working together on the interjections as well. I say to the new Greens, uh, Dutton. Thank you, Minister Watt. The time for answering has expired. Senator Green, second supplementary. Thank you. Thank you, President. On the housing crisis, the Regional uh, Australia Institute Green, has said, please and I'm your seat. I'm waiting for silence. Order. Senator Green, please continue. On the housing crisis, the Regional Australian Institute has said, and I quote, Regional Australia wants policies that will add supply, that will make sure everyone in the community has a housing option available to them. What are the risks to regional and rural Australia if the Albanese government's important housing reforms are not implemented? Minister Watt. Thank you, President. Thank you, Senator Green. Well, of course, we all know that the biggest risk to regional and rural Australians uh, who need more housing in this is this unholy anti-housing alliance that has formed between the Greens, Peter Dutton, and Pauline Hanson. Now, we've all known for a long time uh, that Minister the LNP Watt, has. Minister Watt, I remind you to refer to all MPs and senators by their correct title. Please continue. As we know, the LNP has profoundly let down regional Australians, but the Greens have done so too. For all the Greens' cries for more housing, they don't back it up in their own Senator homes. Uh, so which Green senator, for example, owns a $1 million investment property in Brisbane? It's apparently quite nice. It features a master suite of epic precautions that would keep any of the Kardashians happy. And why did that senator increase Order. the rent on their investment property by 9 per cent while calling for a rent freeze? Minister uh, and which Green senator, senator, senator— Please resume your seat. Order on my left. Senator Hume, order. Please continue. Which Green senator owns four separate properties while telling the Senate last year that the great Australian dream today is owning a property portfolio with tenants who pay your income and your assets? Why would those sort of people now want to stand in the way of other people Thank getting you, a Minister. home and the a roof over their head? The answering has expired. I'm waiting to call a senator for the next question and I expect there to be silence. Order. Senator Tyrrell. Thank you, President. Appreciate it. My question is for the Minister representing the Minister of Health, Senator Gallagher. Your government has acknowledged that your proposed changes to the dispensing limit for pharmacies from 30 to 60 days will mean pharmacists lose income. You have made a welcome commitment that the money your government saves from this measure will be reinvested back into community pharmacies. How much money will pharmacists lose as a result of these changes, and how much are you committing to reinvest? Thank you, Senator Tyrrell. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, and I thank Senator Tyrrell for the question. Um, there is an important change uh, that the government is making based on the advice of the expert group, uh, which has provided this advice to government since 2018, but those opposite ignored and, and didn't address. Uh, it's a significant cost of living measure that's going in. In terms of, in, in terms of reducing people's um, uh, what they have to pay for their medicines, and we know how much that can hit uh, the pocket of many households—six million Australians who rely on regular medicines. 
In terms of uh, the changes and the impact on the budgets, in the order of, I think, from memory, and I will check this, I will correct this if I have to, in the order of uh, just over a billion dollars in terms of savings to, uh, to the government, uh, and we are reinvesting all of that back into pharmacy. We have also heard, and it, it, and it will, Senator and Rustin. we're not disputing that there will be um, you know, lost income to pharmacies. Um, through this, basically because they are not charging people um, every month uh, for the additional um, dispensing fees. Um, if they're only charging that once every two months, that will impact on, on pharmacies' income. Uh, but it also has a, makes a major difference to people who rely on medicines and how much they pay. And these are the decisions that we have thought through Senator carefully. We want pharmacies to do more. We don't want them to be seen as retailers, sort of clipping the ticket in a sense. You know, when they're making the, we want them to be health professionals. They want to be health professionals. Our investments Order are essentially putting that money back into pharmacies, Senator so that Starr. they can do those important jobs like vaccination, like opioid treatments, and other things. I have no doubt the role of the pharmacy pharmacists will change Thank significantly you, the in time coming for years. Answering has expired. Senator Tyrrell, first supplementary. Thank you. Does the government's commitment to reinvestment extend to the 1.6 billion pharmacists stand to lose from prescription copayments? I think. Thank you, Senator Tyrrell. Minister Gallagher. Well, certainly the money that uh, come, what would have normally returned to our budget will, will go back into pharmacy. We make that 100 per cent commitment. We want to work with pharmacy about how these changes rolled through. So we have responded to them. Senator Rustin, it's not your turn. Um, we have responded to pharmacy about Senator the rollout Rustin. of this administration, and you're obviously arguing for people to pay more for their medicine. So there you go. That's Order. what you're doing. Double. You are wanting them to pay more. Uh, that we will make those investments uh, back into pharmacy to make sure that they can um, do, you know, do new programs, more programs, and indeed programs that were facing a funding cliff under the former government. We'll work with them on the phasing of this. So. Coming in in September, then coming uh, in in Minister June. Gallagher, please resume your seat. Uh, January. Uh, Senator Rustin. For an order on relevance, um, I think you'll find that the question that was asked by the senator at the other end of the chamber is not the question that is being answered by the minister. You may draw her attention to it unless she doesn't understand uh, the thank question. Thank you, Senator Rustin. The minister is being directly relevant. Minister, please continue. How's opposition going? Uh, thank you. In terms, if the question relates to whether the government. Uh, Order. The government will, will fund um, the other income, not related to the one that's returning to government. That is not our intention, but we do want Thank to work you, with pharmacy the about the new things they can do. Senator Tyrrell, second supplementary. Thanks, President. Does your government's promise to reinvest every dollar pharmacists pharmacies lose, include or exclude the lost dispensing fees are required to compensate per the current community pharmacy agreement? Uh, thank you, Senator Tyrrell. Minister Gallagher. Uh, well, the, uh, the government remains committed to the agreement uh, and it will continue. Uh, we will enter, no doubt, in the next little while discussions into the eighth um, uh, pharmacy agreement. Uh, but I think the point we're trying to make here is the government got advice that said there is absolutely no reason why people have to come in every month to get their medicines. For a certain number of medicines, you only need to come in once every two months if your doctor approves it. If your doctor approves it, you can get access to this medicine once every two months. It will save you money. It will save money throughout the year. It is safe. It's the advice to government. And if we weren't acting on this, I think people who have to buy medicines every month are right to ask their government why. Uh, because the very clear advice is it's safe, we want to work with pharmacies, and it means that it's cheaper for people who rely on long-term medicine. Thank you, Minister. Senator Chandler. President, my question is to the Minister for Finance, Senator Gallagher. Yesterday on Sky News, former Labor leader Bill Shorten said this. I always think, Senator well, Stirl. there's plenty of property tax concessions and a lot of well-off people still getting some money from the government. Do you agree with Minister Shorten? Thank you, Senator Chandler. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you. I haven't seen uh, the comments to which Senator Chandler refers, and I do note that the opposition has a habit of selectively quoting um, to. Uh, well, you do. 
to be fair, you do. Uh, uh, I think the tax expenditure statement which the Treasurer released uh, earlier this year uh, shows the arrangements that are in place, uh, various um, tax concessions that are in place. We reported it openly and transparently. You can see it in the tax expenditure statement. It's available online, I believe, if you haven't already looked at it. Uh, and the budget uh, that we handed down on uh, Tuesday, just two days ago, uh, doesn't make any change uh, to those arrangements. Uh, the budget that we handed down was very much focused on cost of living relief, uh, about where we could make investments into key services like Medicare, tripling the bulk billing rate, and also how do we repair the budget over time? How do we borrow less? How do we pay less interest? And, and the importance behind returning those upward revisions in revenue to budget repair so that we put the budget on a much more sustainable footing so that we can find room uh, for uh, responsible investments in other areas of services as those decisions get taken. Uh, Senator Chandler, first supplementary. Uh, thank you, President, and thank you, Minister, for your response. Minister, is the government's view that a tax concession or a tax reduction is, as Minister Shorten said, the government giving out money? Or are such tax arrangements a case of Australians getting to keep more of their hard-earned income? Uh, Minister Gallagher. Well, the budget um, outlines the government's position on all of these matters. Um, I would refer you to the budget. Um, you know, it clearly outlines the changes that we've made around taxation. There are, there are some modest and minor changes, but ones that will make a meaningful difference uh, to the budget going forward, particularly outside the forward estimates. So you look at the changes we're making to superannuation, uh, bringing forward some revenue under the arrangements under the PRRT. Uh, that is the position of the government. But I would say you know, um, you know, it's very important, I think, and that's why the tax expenditure statement was released. Uh, that people are aware of the concessionary nature of a whole range of measures uh, that exist in the budget. It's important that we, are, you know, we have uh, that information available to people, um, and those where uh, there hasn't been any change to those concessions uh, in this budget um, that we handed down two days ago. Uh, thank you, Senator. Minister, Senator Chander, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Minister, is the fundamental reason why Australians always pay more under Labor because Labor doesn't actually trust Australians to spend their money on their own needs? Uh, thank you, Senator Chandler. Minister Gallagher. Um, I, I didn't catch the um, end of it, but I think I got the gist of it. Um, uh, Minister, just for clarity, I'll get the uh, Senator Chair, but just to repeat, it's quite a short question. Thank you, President. Uh, Minister, is the fundamental reason why Australians always pay more under Labor because Labor doesn't actually trust Australians to spend their money on their own needs? Thank you. Thank you, Senator Chandler. Minister Gallagher. Thank you, Senator Chandler. It doesn't change my answer, but um, the... the um, the budget that we have handed down, I think, shows the respect with which we hold uh, the Australian people, because it responds to the pressures that are being experienced now. It responds to essential services going forward, and it, it uh, creates um, space to grab the opportunities that come for the future. So it's a story about meeting Australian people's needs now, investing in services and growing the economy so more people get more opportunities in the future. Uh, this is a very responsible budget, and I think it pays respect to the Australian people. Uh, and in terms of the budget repair story, we will be borrowing less, significantly less, under this budget and under the repair strategy that we have implemented. So I don't accept uh, Senator Chandler's proposition. We will borrow $300 billion less, and we will pay. Less, well, we will you, pay Minister. $83 billion dollars less in has interest. Expired. Thank you. Senator Babette. Thank you. My question is for the Minister representing the Minister for Trade and Tourism, Minister Wong. Minister, we live in a global economy and Australia has a lot to contribute to international trade. We are blessed with an abundance of natural resources and an agricultural sector that produces the best food and fibre in the world. I commend the government on their recent success in negotiating trade agreements with the UK and India. Can the minister please update the Senate on the current progress with negotiating a free trade agreement with the European Union? Thank you, Senator Babette. Minister Wong. 
Thank you, um, Senator Bebet. And uh, as you know, uh, as a consequence of uh, thank you of Senator Farrell uh, going to China, also on trade issues, and I'm happy if you come to that in a supplementary question to, to go to that. Um, uh, I will update on the EU as well as the UK, and thank you for your recognition of, of the UK agreement. Uh, securing an ambitious trade deal with the European Union uh, would obviously be a significant step towards creating more opportunities for Australian exporters. One of the points that we have made since coming to government uh, is uh, that diversification of our export markets, which we recognise is a diversification of what we export as well as where, where we export to, uh, is an important part of, of improving our economic resilience. Uh, we, we benefit greatly from trade, bilateral trade with, with, with many countries, uh, and we are better off and more resilient as a nation if we can diversify uh, our, our export markets, which requires, in turn, not only trade agreements, but also a diversification of the goods and services exported. Obviously, the EU, e European Union, uh, which uh, uh, is a very large part of the global economy, it's a, a high-income market, it has about 450 million people, GDP of around uh, $24 trillion. Uh, we are uh, working towards, uh, I know as Minister Farrell is working towards uh, progress uh, or seeking to progress the EU trade agreement. I think there's already been quite a lot of uh, media and discussion about it, including under the previous governments. There are issues uh, that will have to be resolved, um, uh, uh, issues around provenance and so forth. Uh, I know Minister Farrell is working very hard uh, to try and, and um, ensure there is progress on that for the reasons I've outlined. Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Babette, first supplementary. Minister, free trade agreements are a good example of where bipartisanship it delivers great outcomes for the Australian people. Now, on the 6th of March, the government member for Fremantle and chair of the Treaties Committee stated in the Federation Chamber that the independent tribunal system used to resolve investor-state dispute settlements is dodgy. His words. Minister, does your government agree with this statement? Yes or no? Is the ISDS dodgy? Uh, thank you, Senator Bebet. Senator Wong. Uh, thank you. Two points there. First, in relation to bipartisanship, I think you'll find Senator Babette, if, uh, and I know uh, you, you weren't here um, uh, when I was Shadow Trade Minister, nor would you probably remember anything about that, because it may not have been that interesting. But uh, <laughs> I did work quite hard uh, as Shadow Trade Minister to deliver bipartisanship, and it was through that period that the Labor Party um, supported uh, the uh, uh, China Free Trade Agreement, the uh, Korean Free Trade Agreement. Oh, Senator uh, Wong, please question. resume your seat. Senator Babette. Just on relevance there, President, I just would like to know if the ISDS is it dodgy. That's all. Yes or no? Uh, thank you, um, Senator Babette. There was also a, a rest of your uh, question also went to free trade agreements and bipartisanship. Minister Wong. Uh, Senator Bed, I wasn't trying to obfuscate. I was actually trying to be helpful, and I, so I was actually agreeing. I think bipartisanship does matter. I'm also on record from that time, and I think since that time, our party's position has developed, raising concerns about ISDS. Uh, and uh, we all know, for example, uh, that it was my recollection is, and I might be wrong, a Hong Kong free trade agreement and investor-state dispute settlement clause under that, uh, which led to tobacco companies seeking illegal uh, thank action you, Minister. against the time for Australia. For has expired. Senator Babette, uh, second supplementary. Minister, it is important for the integrity of current and future trade agreements that the Commonwealth of Australia abide by the terms of its agreements. Senator we Ayers. know that the same number. We note that the same member of government made further statements on the 30th of March, and I quote, again, the dodgy system known as ISDS. Are we to take it that the arbitrator recently appointed by the Commonwealth to an ISDS arbitration is also dodgy? Yes or no? Is he dodgy or she? Uh, thank you, Senator Babette. Min Minister. Well, I'm not, I'm not going to comment on an individual, and I'm sorry, I don't actually um, know what detail you're referring to, Senator Babette, but I would make this point. 
The clause, the ISDS clause that I referenced in the Hong Kong Agreement, was used by tobacco companies to try and take legal action against an Australian government for plain packaging. Uh, I think that demonstrates, that demonstrates uh, uh, amongst other things, the concerns uh, that many in the Australian community have about those sorts of, 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 of provisions in trade agreements, that they obviate a country's sovereignty or constrain a country's sovereignty. So we in government have said we won't be doing trade agreements with those clauses in them, and we will be going through a process of trying to improve or remove those agreements which um, have those Minister clauses. Minister Wong, please resume your seat. Senator Babette. Once again, uh, relevance is the person who is appointed by the Commonwealth to, the, to ISDS arbitration. Is this person dodgy? That's it. Uh, Thank you, Senator Babette. Uh, Minister Wong went to that part of your question. Uh, Minister, please continue. Uh, well, uh, I again say uh, we have concerns about uh, ISDS clauses when it comes to ensuring that an Australian government can make appropriate decisions on behalf of the Australian community, and we put those on the record. Thank you, Senator Wong. Uh, Senator Polly. President, my question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. After nine long years of cuts and neglect, how is the Albanese Labor government investing in Medicare and, importantly, making it easier to see a doctor? Great. Thank you, Senator Polly. Minister Wong. Uh, thank you, Senator Polly, and thank you for your support for Medicare, for your continued advocacy for public health and public health measures alongside all of your Tasmanian and Labor colleagues. Because this what we know is Labor built Medicare and we will always protect it and we will always strengthen it. And there are some differences between those on this side of the chamber and those on that side. We can go through them. But you know what? Top of the list is Medicare. Medicare, because we are the party of Medicare and we know that you have opposed it and sought to break it over so many years, including under Mr Dutton. I'll come back to you. But in this budget, this Albanese Labor government is making historic investments in Medicare. We believe Australians should be able to access affordable, reliable health care. That is why we are investing $5.7 billion to build a stronger Medicare. Our priority is to invest in Medicare and make it stronger. Their priority was to cut Medicare. Cut Medicare. Those opposite left measures in the budget on a timeline to be cut and they failed to address the needs of Australians, particularly our most vulnerable. This government is investing to ensure the tripling of the bulk billing incentive. This is the largest increase to the incentive in the 40-year history of Medicare. And it will benefit Australians. It will benefit pensioners. It will benefit Commonwealth concession card holders. And it will benefit Australian families. We've wasted no time making medicines cheaper, establishing Medicare urgent care clinics, investing in practices to employ more nurses and allied health professionals. We've committed $219.4 million to extend public dental services because we understand Medicare Thank must you, always Minister be protected. Thank you, Minister Wong. The time for answering has expired. Senator Polly, first supplementary. What a stark contrast. <laughs> Following a sharp decline in bulk billing under the Liberal and nationals, can the minister please outline to the Senate what the government is doing to boost bulk billing? Order, um, Minister Wong. Uh, for almost, uh, thank you for the question. And of course, we we understand how important how important bulk billing is, uh, and that is, and what we also know, and what Australians know, is that over for over a decade, those opposites made bad decisions that eroded Australia's world class healthcare system, and. They weren't up front with the Australian people on the bulk billing rate, which has been in decline. Let's remember they're led by a man who doctors voted uh, as the worst health minister in decades. Now, the principle that all Australians should have to access affordable care underpins Medicare. That is why, as I said, the centrepiece of our strengthening Medicare package is a $3.5 billion investment to triple bulk billing incentives for GP visits. This means 5 million children 
and their families. Seven million pensioners and concession card holders will be able to see a GP without, a, a, without an out-of-pocket expense. Thank you, Senator. While the time for answering has expired, Senator Polly, second supplementary. President, how is the government making Medicare stronger for all Australians, and how does the budget deliver crucial funding for urgent needs of today and reforms for health care for tomorrow? Thank you, Senator Polly. Minister Wong. Uh, thank you, Senator Polly. Well, uh, as I said, we're investing in bulk billing. We're investing in practices to employ more nurses and allied health professionals. We're investing in public dental health services. We're investing $47.8 million in wound care for patients with diabetes and chronic wounds. We're investing in digital health to ensure that critical information sharing more secure, safe and a more secure, safe and efficient information system to benefit patients and clinicians. Those opposite are remembered for many things, and one of them is the GP tax. Let's remember that the man who will front the parliament tonight saying he's going to talk about families was the health minister who sought to impose a tax on Australians going to GPs. The GP co-payment, which Mr Dutton sought to impose, is something every Australian should remember when he stands up tonight and claims he speaks for Australian families. That is why we know it is only those on this side. Time has expired. Order. 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 Senator Smith, you've got one of your own senators on his feet. Senator O'Sullivan. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, uh, Senator Gallagher. What proportion of Australian households will face the impact of higher inflation and interest rates being higher for longer as a result of Labor's budget? but receiving none of your selective handouts. Thank you, Senator O'Sullivan. Um, Minister Gallagher. Well, uh, thank you for the question. And I, I guess we should, expect, um, we should expect that kind of divisive uh, question from those opposite that seek to divide Australia as opposed to unite it. Uh, and if uh, the senator had read the budget papers, they will see that we are predicting that inflation comes down considerably over the next financial year before heading back to the target range. And I would remind those, I would remind those opposite uh, that interest rates uh, began rising under them. They, yeah, because you lost the election, mate. Order. You lost the election. Order. That's why. Order. And we are, have been in a, a period of tightening of monetary policy. Uh, since that time, and that's why the budget has been carefully crafted to not add to the inflation challenge in the economy. Fair but here you go. Here's a list of things where we have our focus on all Australians. This is a budget that seeks to make investments that benefit all Australians, no matter how much you try to divide different groups across our community. In terms of wages growth, who do you reckon that helps? For the first time in a decade, under an overturning of your policy to deliberately withhold wage increases from working people, we are going to see real wages growth. And the reason why we've got significant upward revisions in this budget is because part of the reason is because we are seeing wages growth. Our investment in Medicare, the tripling of the bulk billing rate, supports all families across the country. We're putting downward pressure on inflation to tackle the cost of living, on energy bills, the gas and uh, energy caps that we put in place that you voted against. Yes. Have a look in the budget at what that says about uh, the, the fact that people will be paying less on their bills because oh, as a you, direct Minister, the time result for answering of has expired. Senator O'Sullivan, first supplementary. Yesterday on the Today Show, construction worker Frank was interviewed and said, I feel that our standard of living has reduced considerably. I've never seen it like this. Australia should be considered a lucky country. Are we lucky? No, we're not. Give the working person, the people who support this country, the middle income workers, more relief. Minister, wouldn't Frank and indeed all Australians be better off if you had a plan to tackle inflation rather than a budget that just selects a few winners? Thank you, Senator O'Sullivan. Minister Gallagher. Oh, here we go. It's so predictable. Uh, and would I say, 
Uh, I, didn't, I didn't see that interview, but what I would say is there are challenges in our economy because of 10 years of failure to deal with the challenges, to deal with the energy transition as one example. And we are playing catch up so that we can seize the opportunities and the jobs and the income that is going to come with that tr energy transition. We are uh, putting in place legislation that you voted against to get wages moving in this country. You voted against it every single time we put in this place some legislation to improve the lives of working people. You vote against it. You vote against the Housing Australia Future Fund. You vote against Order, the Senator National Scott. Reconstruction Fund. You vote against everything, every idea that we are bringing into this chamber to build a better future for every Australian. You vote no to it, and then you come in here and start pretending Thank that you're Minister, on their the side. It doesn't for add up. has expired. Senator O'Sullivan, second supplementary. Thank you, President. This budget confirms that cost of living continues to go up. Gas and electricity prices continue to rise, real wages are not growing, inflation remains high, unemployment will rise and Australians will pay more taxes. Why is it that Australians always pay more under Labor? Uh, thank you, Senator O'Sullivan. Minister Gallagher. Thank you, um, Madam President. And what, uh, what the Australian people will see in this budget is targeted cost of living relief helping those that are most vulnerable. Are you opposed to that? Are you opposed to those investments? Because it sounds like you are. Delivering historic investments Order. in Medicare and aged care. Are you opposed to that? Because it sounds like you're opposed to that. Wage increase for aged care workers. Are you opposed to that too? That's in the budget. Uh, is that is because it sounds like you are Senator growing Sullivan. the economy in skills, in small business for renewables. Sounds like you're opposed to that as well. Strengthening the budget Senator surplus, Hume. cleaning up the mess that we inherited. Uh, Eleven and a half billion dollars in legacy funding pressures that just were going to end, tip off a cliff. Fourteen point eight billion dollars, seventeen point eight billion dollars in savings in this budget. We're borrowing less. We're paying less interest. We've returned. We've forecast Thank a surplus you, this financial year, and you're opposed to that. Expired. Senator Wong. I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Senator Smith, do you Thank you the very call? much, uh, Mr Deputy President. Uh, I rise to take note of questions uh, asked, responses to questions asked by coalition senators during this question time. I'm going to start with a history lesson. And Senator Gallagher probably knows which part of the history lesson I'm going to start with, and that is the history of Medicare co-payments in this country. And I want to take everyone back to 1991, and who was the Labor Party leader? Who was the Prime Minister? Bob Hawke. Exactly. And what was happening to Bob Hawke in 1991? He was facing leadership pressures. And what did Bob Hawke, as Prime Minister, and his then Health Minister Brian Howe, do without consultation and announce in the 1991 federal budget? A Medicare co payment of $3.50 and a reduction in the rebate of $3.50. So it lacks credibility for Labor senators to come into this place and try to suggest that it is only coalition members and senators who are interested in a sustainable health system. So let me finish the story. Let me finish the story. What happened, what happened later in 1991? What happened later in 1991, and this is particularly important for the current Treasurer, what happened next? What happened next? The left and the right and the ACT, they ganged up on Bob Hawke, who, to be fair, was a very, very popular Australian Prime Minister. And guess what happened? By Christmas, a week before Christmas, Paul Keating had become the Labor Prime Minister. I understand completely why Labor does not want to go back and hear about the horror story of your experience with Medicare co-payments. Plenty of horror stories under Labor. 
This brings to an end the first week of Labor's second budget. And what will be top of mind to many, many Australian families this weekend is just one word and the consequences of that one word. And that one word is inflation and the consequences of inflation being higher interest rates. When Jim Chalmers attended the National Press Club yesterday, he said he was supremely confident, supremely confident that the budget would not add to inflation. Well, they are very brave and courageous words by the Treasurer, no doubt. And we can't trust, trust the, pre, uh, the Treasurer's supreme confidence that the budget will not drive up inflation, because just a year ago, just a year ago, Anthony Albanese tried to tell Australians that life would be cheaper for them, life would be cheaper for them under Labor. Well, 12 months on, we know that is not true as this country struggles with the very, very real challenge of higher inflation rising interest rates. So we've heard a little bit of commentary earlier in question time today about the remarks of the Westpac chief economist, uh, Mr Bill Evans. And those remarks are important because Mr Evans is a trusted economist. Uh, Westpac is a significant banking institution uh, in our country. And I just want to remind people some observations that Mr Evans made and why they are important for the budget implications and the analysis of the budget that will continue over coming weeks and indeed when we come back for Senate estimates. Mr Evans said that do, does, Mr Evans said, do I believe that rate relief I thought would be that we would get, that Australian families would get in February could be delayed? Mr Evans says yes. Rate relief, falling interest rates that people are expecting to happen in February next year, Mr Evans is saying he thinks that is not going to happen or the chance of that happening is significantly reduced as a result of the budget. What else did Mr Evans say? He also said that the opportunity to cut rates as early as February starts to fade away. That's the one thing I'm worried about with regards to the budget, Bill Evans has said. He also said that $20 billion going into the economy into the space of, in the space of three years is what I would call big spending. <laughs> Mr Evans' comments. Not, not his only comments, but I think some very, very pertinent comments when we think about the challenge that has now arisen as a result of the budget that was delivered on Tuesday night. Now, the budget will not be measured today, tomorrow, two weeks' time, three weeks' time, but in a year's time, when Thank we you. are still in this Thank chamber... You, Senator Smith. Senator Green. You, Deputy President. I'm very pleased to stand and take note of the answers provided today. Um, uh, and, it, and it does um, beg belief, really, that those opposite, um, in defence of, of um, their... Uh, well, their defence of their actions on Medicare over many years and a decade of delay, of ignoring the GP crisis, of, of standing up every day and supporting someone who, as Health Minister, did propose a co-payment, want to go back to a policy um, that Labor was, uh, was supposedly implementing when I was eight years old. I mean, it's two days after the budget and we're going back to 1991 to try to defend the position of the Liberals, which is to not support the things that we put forward. It's clear that they don't support these things. It's clear that they don't support a budget that's responsible, that's measured. It's clear that they don't support the measures in the budget to provide cost of living relief to everyday Australians. Those on this side have been working really hard to get those measures into the budget, to get that relief out to Australian families. And we couldn't be prouder of the work that's been done to make sure that we're taking care of vulnerable Australians, that we're making more opportunities for more Australians, and that we're building a strong future, a strong, resilient economy for our future. The budget strikes this balance between helping Australians through hard times right now and building for the longer term. We're delivering real cost of living relief and the biggest ever investment in bulk billing. The biggest ever 
incentive increase for bulk billing incentives. It is something that needed to be done. And it's something that those opposite would never do because after 10 years of just drilling Medicare down to the ground, starving GPs of resources and getting us to a point where I am sure if they were still in government, we would have got to a point where uh, they would have um, got to the point where Medicare would have been completely privatised. That is their legacy. But in our budgets, we care about Medicare. We built it, we'll protect it, and we are strengthening it. That's what they're against. That's what we are for. We're lowering the cost of medicines on top of this. Another thing, it seems, from the questions today that those oppose. Funding the biggest pay rise for aged care workers. That's what's in this budget. That's what is in this budget, but those on the opposite say we shouldn't be doing. On top of all of this cost of living relief, something that's incredibly important is offering cost of living relief on electricity bills. That is something that was in the budget the other night. We're working with states and territories. And it was something that we had in our October budget because we're completely aware of how important this is for people. Those on the opposite, opposite side had the opportunity to support cost of living energy bill relief in the last, term, uh, last uh, year of um, the parliament, but refused to support it. We're creating opportunities for all Australians to share and making the services that we rely on stronger. Our plan will grow the economy, create new jobs, boost renewable energy and invest in skills and training. Remember that, that problem you also ignored, the skills crisis that you did nothing about for 10 years that was already happening before the pandemic, was made worse by COVID and you had no plans other than paying um, uh, interns $5 an hour to wash cars and getting Scotty Cam to come out of the woodwork and be on a TV ad. That was your plan to fix the skills crisis. Well, we've put real money behind it in our budget because we know that we, uh, we need to get skilled workers into skilled jobs to make sure that Australians have those opportunities. This is a respons responsible budget. It's a practical budget, and it's one that works to clean up the mess of a wasted decade under the Liberal Nationals. And I'll give you one example of that neglect and decay. In Townsville, it's the home, proud home of the Australian Marine um, Science. Australian Marine Science. They're a fantastic organisation, and they do important work in our oceans, um, making sure that we've got the very best marine science in the world. They do incredible work on the Great Barrier Reef. Well, we are at a point where the defunding and underfunding of this incredibly important institution was going to lead to job losses under the previous government. Their equipment was out of date. They hadn't had a refurb of their um, uh, premises for years. There were jobs on the line. Well, in the budget um, last night, the other night, we added $163 million to the budget of the Australian Institute of Marine Science. $163 million to get them back just to where they needed to be. That's Thank what you, this Senator budget Green. does. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. Well, I too rise to take note of the government's answers. And sadly, again today, we've seen the fact that this government has no understanding, no capacity to understand, approach, deal with the economic challenge of our time, the economic challenge of our time, which is inflation. Uh, we had the finance minister in question time uh, basically saying that, that uh, you know, citing an economist who said, oh, at least the least worst the budget is, is it's not going to be inflationary. I mean, that's not, a, that's not a passionate evidence that the government actually understands that they need to act to put downward pressure on inflation, not just, not just do nothing, not just take their hands off the wheel and say, oh, we'll leave that up to the Reserve Bank. They've shown no capacity to understand that inflation is the key economic challenge of our time. Now, so I started in this place yesterday to read out some quotes from senior economists in this country on the impact of this government's budget. And I'm going to continue that because I, I did not get through them all. And it's not like 
uh, Senator Gallagher says that uh, there's just one or two economists you know, out of a, a room of 100 who, who think this is an inflationary budget. Senior economists across a wide range of organisations have come out and said that this budget makes it harder for the Reserve Bank, not easier. The government has failed its first test. David Bassanese, chief economist at Better Share. Contrary to all the talk of a surprise budget surplus for 2022-23, the second Labor budget under Treasurer Jim Chalmers is unambiguously expansionary, with a boost to GDP growth equivalent to around 1.5 per cent over the next two years. This adds to the risk that the RBA will feel the need to raise interest rates at least once and possibly twice more in the coming months. Goldman Sachs, uh, Goldman Sachs Chief Economist Andrew Boak. At a time when the RBA is lifting rates to contain elevated inflation and accelerating labour costs, we assess the budget's near-term boost household incomes as having an incrementally hawkish read-through for monetary policy. Incrementally hawkish read-through for monetary policy. Yes, that's uh, economic language, but it means that interest rates are more likely to go up. USB economist George Tharanow. We also now think the RBA is unlikely to cut the cash rate this year. Specifically, we formally push back our expectation of the first RBA easing to February 24. It's a, a greater risk that inflation will go up and it's going to take longer for inflation to go down. Pinpoint macroeconomic analytics chief economist Michael Blythe. Unfortunately, proposed fiscal settings look a little confused. You're telling me. The policymakers cannot claim that fiscal measures are both stimulatory for households and non inflationary. Mr. Blythe said the government's decision to increase job seeker single parent payment and aged care wages had no inflation offset. Nobody will begrudge lifting payments to welfare recipients, but the hard hearted economists will point out the potential risk of boosting household spending power and adding to labour costs at time of elevated inflation. Yes, there are hard decisions that have to be made. There are hard decisions. Inflation is the key economic challenge of our time. EY Oceania Chief Economist Sherelle Murphy. The government plans to spend more than it's saved in the short term. In normal times, the economy would easily absorb this stimulus, but inflation is already running at an annual rate of 7% and more than one in every four dollars spent in the Australian economy is by state, territory, local or federal governments. This is an expansionary budget. It puts upward pressure on interest rates. It forces the Reserve Bank to consider con continuing to raise interest rates further and higher than they've already had to to contain the inflation that give this government continues to ignore. Senator Sheldon. Uh, Acting Deputy President. Well, interest rates, you know, isn't it interesting, just before I start, like, these are the people that are giving lectures about interest rates and inflation and how to deal with the cost of living. I mean, they're the ones that started this whole rise and with the commencement of interest rates going up into this economy. Now, they seem to forget that one of the big issues that we had was a failed energy strategy and policy, consistently 22 failed energy policies from those opposite that put the pressure on our cost of living in this country. And of course, if you look at the budget, you clearly see that the Treasury's assessment is that interest rates over the uh, inflationary pressures is clear in the budget papers because it says that the cost of living package is expected to directly reduce inflation by three quarters of a percentage point in 23-24. And of course, you also have to realise the importance of this budget, getting inflation right and support for our community. A $14.6 billion cost of living relief package has been critical to hard hit Australians to be supported. But what they're saying is nothing, because what they're actually saying is that we should turn around and do nothing. We shouldn't turn around and support hard-working Australians. We shouldn't support those people that are at such a disadvantage due to this increase of inflation that commenced under their watch. Now, let's just start looking at the building the capacity 
to deal with future shocks in the future. 87 per cent of revenue windfall over the budget and the last, compared to 40 per cent average over the last governments, that's the money that will be going into dealing with some of the issues that have pressure on our spending within our budget. We've prioritised and saved almost $40 billion, and that's returned 87 per cent. 87 per cent of a revenue windfall over the budget, over the last compared to 40 per cent averaged by the last government. But these are significant figures because it actually puts us in a position to deal with future shocks in our economy. It's actually making sure that we have the capacity to deal with the future. Now, quite clearly, with, when we go to these questions about you know, what has an economist said, well, what they fail to leave out and what they fail to quote is ANZ Adelaide Timbrell or Namura Andrew Tishurst or Alan Oster from National Australia Bank on Tuesday or JP Morgan, Ben Jarman or ANZ Richard Yestinger, which I might just quote him in particular, because all of those previous uh, economists have said that at, best, at worst this will be neutral and many have supported the fact that this budget will have a positive effect on inflation. Now, the particular quote from ANZ is that $14.6 billion in household support is the largest package of spending. Yes, and in Australia's $2 trillion economy, this won't make the inflation challenge materially worse. That's what was said. And of course, to hear the, those opposite saying to quote Westpac, well, how about you quote everything that Westpac said and Mr Evans said? Because Ms Evans said this, I think these policies were necessary. Listen to that word, necessary. And I don't expect them to put upward pressure on interest rates in the near future. Now, these are some of the important aspects of what we've done in this budget. And of course, what they don't want to do is talk about cost of living, because they haven't any plan for it. Because these are the same people that voted down having a strategy to put downward pressure on energy prices. These are the same people that have turned around and made sure that they wouldn't support secure jobs and better pay proposals so that people have the capacity to deal with cost of living. They're the ones that turned around and didn't want to have people uh, getting more secure jobs so they can bargain more fairly. These are the people that turned around and refused to support the appropriate fee-free TAFE and cheaper childcare. The expanded paid parental leave scheme, introducing the pedestrian violence leave, all these strategies they have been consistently trying to undermine or have opposed in this place. And of course, the real question for those opposite will be the future reforms, because same jobs, same pay, minimum work standards for gig workers, an objective definition of casual employment and the pathway to permanent employment, and criminal offence for deliberate wage theft. Let's see what they do because that will show them up for what they think about cost of living. Because they are not about taking it on. They're not about giving people the opportunity to have a decent wage, a decent income, and they certainly haven't got a plan to deal with inflation. Senator Fawcett. Thanks, uh, Mr Deputy President. Uh, I too rise to take note of the answers, uh, in this case from Senator Gallagher, to the first supplementary question by Senator Smith, who pointed out um, that the Minister for Aged Care said, and I quote, that this is a budget that will put downward pressure on inflation uh, and highlighted that that was in contrast to the economists from countless banks and rating agencies who have called this budget expansionary. Um, Senator Gallagher gave a response and she mentioned, pleasingly, the concept of frameworks because it's really important if we're not just going to look at short-term perturbations but long-term impacts, we need to understand the consequences that the frameworks we have in place. And I notice when we come to the issue of cost of living, and I go here to the Cost of Living uh, Committee, which has been inquiring into that in their interim report, that uh, one of their key findings is that energy prices have risen and are a major contributing factor to the cost of living crisis in all sectors of the economy. So what has that got to do with frameworks? Well, the government's rejection of the expert opinion of a number of economists in terms of inflation, uh, it's not the first time. They have form on that. I was flabbergasted to see Mr Bowen in the other place 
say in response to an answer or a question uh, in the House that every sensible economist would tell you that nuclear energy is the most expensive form of energy there is. I'm paraphrasing there, I haven't got his exact words, but that was the sense of his answer. Well, the OECD, who globally are probably the most reputed group of economists looking at economic cooperation and development around the world, uh, actually issued a report last year in April where they looked at the frameworks that countries put in place around their energy systems. And they actually highlight, and on page 35 of their report, which was a strategic briefing on meeting uh, emissions targets, uh, they look at the levelised cost of electricity across the OECD for various forms of energy generation, and they highlight that um, the lowest cost option for generating electricity is the long-term operation of nuclear power plants. And that's quoting work done by uh, themselves and the IEA, the International Energy Agency, in 2020. But as they highlight in their report, that's only part of the equation. When you look at the system's costs and you also look at the context in which we are seeking to reduce emissions by 2030 and getting to net zero by 2050, uh, for anyone who's interested, I'd highly recommend looking at pages 37 and 38 of the report because they highlight that as you constrain emissions and you take fossil-based fuels out of the system, and you must remember here in Australia and national electricity market still uses nearly 70 per cent fossil fuels, that the costs will go up exponentially beyond about 2030. And to quote from them, they say the policy implications of these systems cost findings are significant. It may be possible to reduce emissions to meet 2030 targets by growing the share of variable renewables in the mix. However, the costs of reaching net zero with high shares of variable renewables are likely prohibitive. And they go on to make a conclusion, which is backed up by the IPCC and the IEA, that the only way we can still have reliable, affordable power and reach net zero is to embrace a form of base load power which is either hydro, if you have the suitable conditions, or nuclear power, which is why so many countries, such as the US, are looking to double their amount of nuclear power. And to the issue of expense, not only did they find that long-term cost of electricity shows that it's cheaper, but from a grid scale, as we seek to reduce emissions, the framework says it will be cheaper. And if we look at the lived experience of nations like Germany, high levels of variable renewables, the most expensive power in the OECD by a country mile, versus Canada, which has the lowest penetration of variable renewables, hydro, but also 19 nuclear reactors, they have the lowest energy price in the OECD. And Ontario, the province which has those reactors in it, and the majority of their power comes from those reactors, is amongst the cheapest provinces in Canada. So frameworks matter, and the framework of this government will just drive up prices further. I put the question to the motion moved by Senator Dean Smith. Those for the question say aye. Against, no. The ayes have it. Senator Pocock. I also rise to take note of Senator Gallagher's response to my questions about PwC. I'm going to start by clearly laying out some of the facts of this outrageous case of institutional corruption and cover-up. Every parliamentarian, indeed every Australian, must be horrified by this chapter. And I know that many are because they're contacting our office in outrage. First, the facts. On 16 November 2022, the Tax Practitioners Board published their findings that former PwC partner Peter Collins breached three confidentiality agreements by leaking government tax policy to staff and partners at PwC to monetise that information by assisting private clients to sidestep the new multinational tax avoidance laws. Peter Collins was deregistered for two years as a tax agent and PwC was required to roll out confidentiality training. Confidentiality training, I ask you. It's outrageous. It's so inadequate. At estimates in February, the ATO estimated that up to $180 million in annual tax revenue would have been at risk from Mr Collins' breach. 
The same estimates, Taxation Practitioners Board Secretary Michael O'Neill said that 20 to 30 PwC staff were implicated in the leak. PwC CEO at the time, Tom Seymour, contradicted O'Neill's evidence, claiming the board had made, quote, no findings to support the statement that 30 staff had access to this information and that claims about the breach uh, that claims about the breach were a perception issue in PwC uh, Tom Seymour's view. Shocked by the revelations unfolding in relation to PwC and the huge increase in spend on consultants in the public sector over the last decade, we're talking billions of dollars, in early March I initiated a Senate inquiry to investigate government use of consultants with a focus on management of unethical behaviour, conflicts of interest and breaches of contract. That committee is working hard. It will go hard, and taxpayers want us to. Since then, more evidence has emerged in relation to PwC. On 2 May, 144 pages of redacted emails were released involving 53 PwC email addresses related to the leaking of information. They make an extraordinary read. It's clear that Tom Seymour had significantly downplayed the extent of the breach, and this wasn't a perception issue or the case of one bad egg, but systemic institutional corruption and very, very poor internal culture and leadership. Days after the emails were published, Tom Seymour admitted he had received emails relating to the leak and stepped down as CEO, and last night two other senior executives followed him, though it's important to note that all three still remain at PwC. The emails also revealed that PwC collected $2.5 million in fees as it did this um, extraordinary act. It's an, an astounding case of corruption in a company that employs 10,000 Australians and whose website front page says, and I quote, our purpose is to build trust in society. Unbelievable. So what are, uh, these are the facts. Um, what's the facts of the government's response so far? Well, I encourage you to keep your expectations very, very low. And this will be short. I wrote to the finance minister in March um, asking her uh, to remove PwC from the Management Advisory Services Panel, which gives PwC access to government contracts, because they have clearly failed to meet the panel requirements. The Minister's Department confirmed that estimates the Department of Finance can terminate uh, a consultant off the panel. And to be clear, it is absolutely in the Minister's uh, Minister of Finance's remit to do so. She has not done this. She has not banned them and instead has sought assurances that this won't happen again. Completely inadequate. So there's four things the government needs to do immediately. First of all, stop cozying up to the large consulting firms, taking their money and political donations and keeping them safe when they do things that are totally inadequate. Secondly, cease and ban all contracts with PwC. And thirdly, initiate civil proceedings against PwC to recover a huge loss of government revenue and ensure that the, a the Australian Federal Police investigate this matter under the Crimes Act. And finally, will you work, will the government work with this parliament? We are all appalled across the political spectrum and support the Greens' call today to refer this matter to the National Anti-Corruption Commission. That's where it belongs. We need to, to run down this uh, corruption and look more broadly beyond the bad apple to the systemic nature of the consulting industry and what it's getting wrong. Thank you. I put the question, those, those for the question say aye, against no, the ayes have it.